So, um, it's my... It's my honor to present, I was looking for you to make sure that you were in the room. It's my honor to present uh, Deborah Goldberg. Deborah uh, was the chair of EEB for like 12 years, was it? For like 12 years, I've been a colleague of John for 30 years or so. Uh, and, and those of you who were, I think most of you were there last night, you, you uh, heard her talk about her relationship with John, so I don't have to get into any of the details. <laughs> but um, so Deborah very, very graciously agreed to give this talk um, uh, today. So we're going to open uh, the, the day with, with uh, Deborah, and the title of her talk is John Vandermeer, the Consummated, the consummated <laughs> Ecologist. Good. So I actually was given this title. I thought by Yvette, but maybe not. Um, Jono. Jono. Jono gave me the title. Um, and I said, hi. <laughs> Nobody wants to. Uh, anyway, but I did decide I had to go look up and make sure I knew exactly what it meant. And um, first of all, I had to make sure that I had the, the adjective, not the verb, uh, which means something <laughs> entirely different. Um, and, but the adjective, I think, is, uh, despite the fact that if you heard me last night, John and I usually don't agree, I do agree that John shows an incredible degree of skill and flair, complete in every detail, and perfect. <laughs> Except when you're wrong. <laughs> And there are many wonderful synonyms for that that I found, and so you can choose your fa favorite one. But I'm going to stick with perfect. OK. Um, but I also wanted to add one thing to the title, which is John is not only is, um, a consummate ecologist, he is a consummate professor. Now, yesterday, so many of you talked so wonderfully and eloquent about John. John's many roles beyond what we typically think of as a professor, as an ecologist, his role as an activist, his role um, as um, inspiring people to do things well beyond academia, and in, in bringing about and inspiring people to bring, aback, bring about social, important social and ecological change in the world. What I'm going to do today is talk about the part of him that is um, maybe got a little less attention, which is that without all of those, every single wonderful thing that everybody said about him yesterday, he would still be an absolutely amazing exemplar of what a professor and what a researcher should be. So I'm going to talk about that part of him, the ecologist and the professor. Um, probably more on the ecology, just because I have a 45-some-odd career to summarize in 15 minutes. So I'm, I'm going to skip a lot. But, um, but I have to say, <laughs> see, that's the John that you all don't maybe see as much. To tell you the truth, I've never seen that either. Um, it may be the jacket. I did see him in a jacket once. And I asked him about where he got that jacket. And he said, well, I don't know. Maybe somebody in this room will claim this line. When he wore the jacket to teach, somebody said, how many polyesters did you have to kill to wear that jacket? <laughs> <laughs> will anybody claim that? John, do you remember who was? Peter. Peter. <laughs> Great line. I love it. OK, I don't know if that one is or not. This is a John we more often see. But both of those are, um, you know, he does, not the tie, but does wear a jacket to teach sometimes, or at least used to. OK, so John as ecologist. I, when I describe what John does to people, I've gotten to write lots of award letters for John, which were, are some of the easiest ones I've ever had to write. I describe him as having three main research areas in which he's contributed in ecology. Um, in theory, in tropical ecology, and agroecology. What I often don't say with all of those is what informs them and, and makes it all um, so really beyond those, those disciplines is that John is, to 
what to me was, was uh, an amazing, a wonderful surprise. He's a fantastic natural historian. And, um, you know, you saw the, the yoga position that, you know, he just knows his organisms incredibly well and that informs an awful lot of what he does. Notice I kind of took the circle around most things. I didn't take it around all of ecological theory, um, which are part of the places where we might disagree. I, I Thinking about the, um, the natural historian and the theoretician, I got the, what is sometimes the, the extremes of that. I found two papers of John in 1972. And Jerry, you actually mentioned both of these. So I was almost going to skip it, but I thought I'll give a little more detail. One is, um, in 1972, John published this paper exemplifying some of the natural history on observations. That's, that, you know, that's the first word of a title about a, of a natural history paper. Observations on paramecium occupying arboreal standing water in Costa Rica. Really classic title, and I said I'd never read that paper. I went back and looked at it, and um, basically it was the fact that there's paramecium in Heliconia, but there's no paramecium in bromeliads. Um, one little thing about the natural history, John, you did not identify the paramecium species. You did not identify the bromeliad species in there, but did. Um, and then simply did an experiment where you washed out the bromeliads or didn't and put in fresh, um, clear water. And lo and behold, if you washed out the um, bromeliads so that there was no, none of the standing water, you could get paramecium. And then more experiments to do that. There were all these really wonderful, quick experiments. I looked a little more closely, and it's very clear this was an OTS experiment. <laughs> I figured you'd think. No? Organization for Tropical Studies, La Selva. No? <laughs> okay. We'll, we'll talk about it later. Okay. Anyway, and then at the same year, he published, John published a paper in Ecology on the Covariance of the Community Matrix. Very um, well known paper. Jerry mentioned it. Uh, you know, it developed the equations for the covariance in the com competition coefficients among species in the matrix, and then has this wonderful line in the abstract about, so we're describing what, um, how to calculate this, followed by tables for determining the expected number of species in a community from a knowledge of mean alpha and the covariance of alpha. Now, I defy you to tell me how that is informed by natural history. <laughs> So what I love about, about John is that he has this incredible love for natural history and also an incredible love for theory. And over the years, those have grown much, I think, much closer together. And um, I think they started off a little more separately, and they have come together really beautifully over the years. Um, I'm still not sure about where heteroclinic cycles and intransitive loops fit into this, but <laughs> OK. I'm going to do a brief timeline of John's um, career. And I found this marvelous picture of um, high school. Looks like a high school graduation picture. One of the great things in the department, Pat says yes, is that, John, it turns out that in the department, maybe all the rest of the faculty should know this, there's a folder of old photographs of every one of us. Um, it's kind of scary, but I went in and said, do we have any old photographs? And we found a bunch. Here's one. Not sure exactly when. Now it's kind of, you know, we've seen some that look like that. And OK, now there's the, the familiar John. Well, we've seen a lot, but I love these two over here. So I'm going to start. Oh, I also wanted to just give a few honors. Um, John was so far ahead of his time in his work, especially his applied work, and, and understanding that what, as biologists, as ecologists, we need to do things that actually have some meaning in the world, that in some ways he wasn't taken as seriously by the department as he should have been. It took a while to get some recognition. It wasn't until um, in the 90s he was um, named a Thurnau professor for his teaching. In 2002, he became the Margaret, Margaret uh, Davis, not David collegiate professor, and um, I think it was about 2010 or 11, he's now the Asa Gray Distinguished University Professor, which is the highest honor you can get at the university. 
Uh, some of you may not know that Asa Gray was actually the first faculty member at the University of Michigan, which is why John chose him, which is one of those very interesting factoids. But on the other hand, he never taught here. <laughs> okay, so I just am going to do a brief timeline of some of John's research um, along this time. And um, I'm not going to even do all of these. And this, of course, doesn't cover the, the full range of things he's done. Um, some of the more empirically oriented, some of the more purely theoretical on top, but of course always an integration across those. We'll start with John's dissertation, which as many of you know, um, was on um, what has become a really, really important topic in ecology, which is about the role of higher order interactions if we simply have a competition coefficient and alpha, how two species interact, that the presence of additional species can really change the nature of that alpha, change qualitatively, quantitatively how they interact. And John did what I think was the first experimental test of are, do these actually occur in a very simple system with the idea if they occur in the simple system, that they will occur, and he did it in a very um, elegant way of estimating from experiments the pairwise interactions, fitting them into a model to see, um, to predict what the interactions would be if all the species were together, and showed that for at least one of the, the species, the predicted is a solid line, that you actually get a significant deviation. That is, there were indeed significant higher order interactions in this community. So not only could he show it, he could show it quantitatively. And, and that's something that we still don't do enough of in ecology is actually show quantitative deviations from theory and use those to estimate the magnitude of processes. So I think this was um, a really important paper and higher order interactions has become a huge part of ecology um, in the many years. Since that, they're now called trait mediated interactions. Um, but um, it, this is one of the really important themes that informs our understanding of biology and actually a really important integration of natural history and theory and what those words are. Okay. One of his first funded NSF projects was a study of what somebody said yesterday, John referred to as the most beautiful plant in the world, um, Welfia. And um, he had two field assistants on that project. Um, Steve Reich, and this is Kathy Bach over there, or at least Kathy tells me that's Kathy <laughs> over there, um, who, and apparently Steve is feeding John tuna fish out of a can, <laughs> um, doing field work. So, uh, you know, this is the, uh, you know, John, le yeah, <laughs> leaning back. Um, this paper, um, there are a number of, of of detailed papers on the demography, but some of the important theory, as, as often happens with John, his empirical work informs and brings him to important general theoretical points. In this case, it was people were just starting to use projection matrices to actually to be able to estimate population dynamics from demographic data. And John pointed out some real issues in the um, in how we calculate those, how we data, and it's most um, specifically something that I came across before I knew him as something I needed to worry about, um, inspired by John, that the actual size, how you, that choosing how big your classes are could have a really big impact on what your, your projected dynamics were. And that we were making some assumptions in our th application of this theory that we didn't realize we were making. And John pointed that out really nicely. I think it's taken until the last several years to really solve that problem with the integrated projection um, m m modeling. Okay. Um, then came the whole era of intercropping theory and, um, and experiments. This is John. Um, a man outstanding in his field <laughs> with um, <laughs> graduate students working behind him, Yvette. This was when early days. I, there was actually another version of this picture where John's standing there with like this, and, but <laughs> not that one. Okay. Um, so 
Um, this um, a whole body of work, um, I'm not really sure this has inspired me to ask what I haven't had a chance to discuss, maybe we can later, is what actually got you into the intercropping, into agriculture, because there are no signs of it in that earliest work you were doing. And so that's another, a whole question that I think we should ask John to speak about later. Um, but he made really important contributions, basically put the theory of agriculture, um, took ecological theory and applied it, showed how it could really explain and be used to understand and predict things about agroecology, about polycultures and diverse ecological systems. And this work has continued to expand. Um, he, in a really important paper in 1981, where he talked about the uh, sort of culminated in some of this the interference production principle, the idea of just making it, it obvious, showing both theoretically, um, how, showing theoretically that the principle of the competitive exclusion principle, which could also be called the competitive togetherness principle, he pointed out was exactly the same um, theory as the idea of land equivalence ratio and when should you have a polyculture versus culture and, and just in this particular theory, which we can talk about some other time, um, he actually brought these together and showed that they're the same theory and I better move quickly here, um, that's really well known about the ecology of intercropping. Um, I should notice these books, which I'm not gonna, all over there, me, we're over there, many of them have, come out of his teaching and out of his theory. So one of the ways in which John is the consummate professor is how he turns his research and his teaching into textbooks which then further inform his research. That integration, that cycle has been really wonderful. Um, another whole gr um, large body of work came out of Hurricane Joan in 1988. Um, John, as we talked, heard yesterday, John and, and many of his colleagues and students were already working in Nicaragua um, through NUAG with applying agroecological agro ideas and bringing those to the community. But it then started with Hurricane Joan that just devastated huge areas of rainforest, started working on rainforest dynamics. And how does that then relate to species diversity? Again, an important paper in science showing that you actually had much higher diversity in the recovering forest than in the um, undisturbed forest that was not hit by the hurricanes, and that these large, not, whereas that's not true in small tree fall gaps, and therefore large catastrophic disturbances might be much more important for maintaining forest diversity than the tree fall gaps that everybody was talking about. Um, and again, a huge body of work to which many people in this room contributed significantly, um, as well as all the other things everybody we talked about in Nicaragua that were happening yesterday, that we were talking about yesterday. Um, and then I'm just going to take one example of um, his lot of work in nonlinear dynamics. It's sort of the more purely theoretical work um, because it has really important applications. This is, um, John became, oh, back in, in the um, early, in the 80s already, he started working on nonlinear dynamics, um, chaos, and the ideas about chaos, and many of these were, were um, this is actually a later paper, and this was 99, but one I really like <laughs> on basin boundary collisions, um, which is basically the idea that if you have separate zones of attraction where you have chaotic attractor here and a chaotic attractor here, that if you change the parameters in the equations, not the structure of the equations, but just the parameters in the equations, you actually can get um, changes, expansion of these basins of attraction so that they actually collide and one can sort of capture another one. So you get, instead of these two separate attractors, you have a huge, um, um, actually, an expanded strange attractor or chaos. So John has um, and then talked about the important part about this. He talks about how these understanding these kind of dynamics can help us understand the possibility of regime shifts, regime shifts in the uh, even in our ecological sense, not in the political sense, 
Um, but I don't know, have you ever applied your ideas about regime shifts and ecological models to political systems? <laughs> okay. Um, and so, again, this theory that is informs his ideas about, about real systems and real systems inform his theory. Um, and finally, the last, I'm not going to talk about this because so many of you talked about it yesterday and um, have been involved in this research, is um, the systems he's been working on very closely with Yvette over the last, oh, what, 15 years now at least on biocomplexity, coffee agrosystems in Mexico. And I think this area is where perhaps the most is really um, where all of his different interests in tropical ecology, in agroecology, and in theoretical ecology, and natural history all come together in a really beautiful way of looking at the system. And that it both informs really important applied issues as well as informing ecological theory and, um, and tropical ecology in really important ways. I also want to add that I think this is, um, he, this is where he and Yvette have really come together as, as the perfect partners in bringing this work together. And I um, continue in awe of both the, the quality of the work, the, the, the comprehensiveness of the work, and the community that you both have built in bringing all of this together. So John, the consummate ecologist, professor, activist, friend, and human being.